All right, so we are recording. So be mindful of everything you say. We'll go down to posterity for one of our students. I do. Um, Mike and uh, Chaz, I'm going to have you go ahead and uh, shut off your video or stop video if you can see how to do that there. Stop video? <clears throat> yeah, you see where the stop video is there? I believe I did shut it off. All right. Chaz, yours is still on. I don't know if you can see the control there. I can't see me here. Wait a minute. Oh, we can see you. That's not my book. Rick looks like he's uh, getting into the final stages of getting ready. I'm going to go ahead and do the first eight slides. First of all, welcome to everyone. We're so happy to have you. Can you all see the, uh, what's that? Deb, go ahead and uh, can you, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Uh, anybody, if uh, nothing personal, but if you have questions, go ahead and send me a message via the chat function. And that well, way, um, if we uh, have someone who's speaking with this large of a group, we can get through it. So again, um, I have information here from the official slideshow. Uh, can you hear me okay, Rick? You can nod if you can hear me okay. I can hear you fine, Bob. All right. So welcome to Auxiliary Weather. Uh, the purpose of this class is to help you assess the weather uh, for practical terms. Uh, obviously, it's going to be most beneficial for coastal patrols by auxiliary vessels and also to help those of you that are public education instructors teach your students on what to be thinking of as they're getting ready to set sail. The scope of this course, uh, this is not an advanced meteorology course. It does get a little complicated at times, but we're going to go into the basic principles of meteorology and we're going to talk a little bit about physics without delving too deeply into math. We have eight lessons. We have uh, four sessions, which means two uh, chapters per lesson. We'll talk towards the end of the class about the process of taking the exam. Uh, our first class uh, for this group was offered in December. We had 12 students. Uh, 10 of them completed the online exam, so that's uh, what, about 83% completion rate. Last month, we doubled the size, more than doubled the size of the class. We had 25 students in this auxiliary specialty class, and 23 of them completed the final exam. So that was a 92% completion rate. But those are sort of beginning uh, the OXOP classes. This one's going to be a little more challenging. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, getting started, atmospheric uh, properties and behaviors, weather systems, internet weather products, forecasting methods, and tips. <laughs> and finally, coping with adverse weather. So the final lesson will be the, the thunderstorms. Um, this is uh, probably as far as I wanted to go. See, like one other thing, Rick. Wasn't there one other thing I wanted to touch base with? Um, I'm, I'm not too sure. I mean, if it comes up, I'm sure we'll find out towards the end of the session, right? Okay. Uh, and well, I'm going to change over to your PowerPoint that you sent me, or do you, do you want to share your screen, Rick, or no? Um, as long as it allows me to do so, let me just double check here. Hey, Bob, um, while you're doing that, it's uh, J.R. Cook. I just don't want to interrupt you once you guys get started. So, Well, you know what I'm going to do, J.R.? I'm going to let Rick set up, and then I'm going to introduce you if that sounds fair. Yeah, that's great. You just let me know, sir. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. All right. So, so um, I, you need to make me host or co-host so I can share my uh, PowerPoint. All right. See if it works now. I just changed it. All right. <clears throat> Does it lie to share your screen? It should now, yeah. All right, fantastic. So, and before the we... only thing I need to do is to make sure that um, everybody could see my slides change. So, all I need to do is have one person say, Yes, Rick, I see your slides change. Yes, Rick. Okay. Yes, yeah. Rick, I see your slides change. So, Rick, before we jump into this, everyone, I'd like to uh, introduce our division commander. Uh, J.R. Kulik just took the position last month, and he's been encouraging us to do more member training. So, J.R., if you'd like to share, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. And you know what, Rick? When J.R. is ready to hand over the uh, baton, I'll let you. Sounds good. Hey, everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is J.R., as Bob just said. And I just wanted to take literally one minute at the top of the course to uh, welcome all of you to uh, Aux Weather and uh, to thank you all for being here. I know that all of you are 
very, very busy people uh, with a lot going on in, in life these days. So thanks for taking the time to be um, here and participating in this uh, auxiliary specialty course. As Bob mentioned, um, Aux weather is one of the more difficult courses we have in the auxiliary uh, because it is one of the more technical courses that we have. Uh, that being said, I have no doubt that uh, Rick and Bob and your other instructors are going to get get you all through this just fine. So um, I really think it's wonderful that you all are participating in this. So uh, that's all I really wanted to say. And lastly, I just wanted to thank uh, Bob for setting this up. He has already really has stood out uh, in the division in terms of uh, teaching courses uh, this year, already putting on several. Um, so thank you so much to Bob and Rick and all the other instructors. Uh, if you have any needs from the division, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, Bob knows how to contact me um, and you'll always just find me in the AUX directory. Again, thanks, have a great course, everyone. All right, uh, thank you, JR. So as Bob and JR mentioned, my name is Rick. <clears throat> I go by Rick DeMaio formally, uh, but I also teach um, aviation meteorology um, at Lewis University Airport, uh, where Lewis University is. I also teach a course on environmental science and climate change at Loyola University. And I just recently authored um, a textbook on aviation meteorology. It's actually two volumes uh, and consists of about uh, 20, 20 chapters with another two uh, expected to be written. Um, I started out my professional career as a meteorologist with United Airlines. Um, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin uh, similar to Bob. Um, I was a year ahead of him. We never knew each other, but I'm sure we probably bumped into each other on the 14th floor. That's the map room up on the campus there. Uh, my first two years was spent at State University of New York College at Oswego. Um, and the only reason why I went there was because that's all I could afford. Um, and it was about as close as to Lake Ontario um, as you can get. I grew up in uh, Queens, New York. I was a stone's throw from um, the Rockaway Beach area where I went to high school, Beach Channel High School. And even when I was a senior in high school, I actually wrote um, a uh, senior thesis on the difference between inland weather and coastal weather, uh, basically taking observations for about a nine month period of time in my backyard in Queens, and then at the site of the high school in Rockaway Beach, to determine the difference between the sea breeze. So even as a young kid, as most weather people are, um, I had the weather bug and I needed to know more about it. So going up to Oswego was um, always, I, I think, um, a desire to get as close to the Great Lakes as possible. Um, I think I kind of saw all I needed to see living close to the Atlantic Ocean, knowing that the weather on the shoreline of Lake Ontario was gonna be much more volatile. Uh, particularly during the winter time. However, the second winter that I was up there was one of the strongest El Ninos uh, you'll ever see between 1982 and 1983. And when you have El Nino, you generally have mild weather across the Great Lakes, or at least lack of cold weather. And because of that, we did not have as much lake effects to know. So I felt like I was cheated uh, for that, that sophomore year. Um, Oswego did not prove to be much of a challenge, so I transferred to the University of Wisconsin-Madison only because my synoptic teacher, when I was at Oswego, suggested I do so. Um, and I did, and uh, I loved my two and a half years at Wisconsin. I spent the summer there as well. Um, it was the best school uh, for, I think, undergraduate synoptic meteorology because we had some of the best teachers and TAs that you can imagine. One of my TAs, Russ Schneider, who probably Bob Allen knows, is now the director of the Storm Prediction Center down in Norman, Oklahoma. So, so it's pretty good when your TA actually becomes one of the five main, um, if you want to call it, directors of the branches <clears throat> of NOAA, those being the Aviation Weather Center, Storm Prediction Center, National Hurricane Center, Climate Prediction Center, and the National Center for Environmental Prediction. So once I left Wisconsin. I got a job with United Airlines about three months after I graduated. So I went back from Queens back to the Midwest and I've been here ever since. Um, did 12 years with United Airlines, had a chance to do some TV weather. 
Um, I did that for about a year before they hired me full time. And I was pretty much the morning person and then the evening person um, at Fox from 96 to 2007. Um, I left in 2007 um, and did some part-time work with Channel 2 while I was um, basically going back to school and getting my master's degree. Um, never really wanted to do TV, so when I went back to school and got my master's, I focused on what else but aviation weather. So I did two star research papers to fulfill my master's, and that was pretty much on turbulence related to convective complexes. Um, and then different ways to forecast turbulence. So the stuff that I learned in United, it never really left me. And then since then, I've been uh, basically teaching full time now um, at two different universities. And I love it. And every once in a while, you'll hear me on WGN radio. I was on today discussing the NTSB report from uh, the accident that killed Kobe Bryant. Um, so I'm kind of like their go to guy about aviation and climate when um, they have skilling basically to do, you know, the weather, you know, day-to-day -day stuff like that. Um, so as Bob knows, um, weather is in my blood, weather is in his blood, and every meteorologist, it's pretty much not work, it's fun. So what we're going to have today is a discussion about weather that you need to know to keep yourself safe. Uh, Lake Michigan, as you all know, is the seventh largest body of fresh water um, in the world. Uh, I lived for seven years in Rogers Park, right on the end, or right at the end of Chase Avenue, which if you all know the Chicago area, that's in Rogers Park, and literally my apartment overlooked the lake. It's about as close as you can get to the lakefront. There's nothing in front of you other than water. Uh, we went from 3% ice about two weeks ago to now about 20% ice on the Great Lakes. And as you all know, ice is a really good buffer along the shoreline, it keeps the waves from eroding the beaches. So the fact that we have some ice on the lake front is really good because the lake levels are still abnormally high. Um, and whether or not that's induced by climate change is another question because I've seen extremely low lake, low lake levels due to a changing climate. So I don't really think rising lake levels have much to do with the changing climate. It's more of a highly variable climate that the lake levels fluctuate. So you wanna know more about the basics of weather, you want to know more about what creates seasons, and that's what I'm here to teach you. And hopefully um, I can enlighten you and give you something that you can bring away or take away from this course that you can bring um, to the field. Um, just today, I taught three classes of aviation students at a 7.30, a 9.30, and a noon, each one an hour and 45 minutes. And these are basically student pilots air traffic controllers, flight dispatchers, and aviation administration. So everything that I teach them, I try to relate what's going on outside. And that's the only way you're really gonna learn is to be able to connect the dots. When you connect the dots, the dots never really go away. You just use them in a way that makes you um, a smarter, more resilient um, uh, observer of weather. You're never always gonna get it right, the key is to not get it wrong as much so you get a pretty good batting average, decreasing your vulnerability um, by being able to adapt to changing weather conditions. And man, do they change on the Great Lakes. So that's what we're here for. All right, so what causes the weather? Basically, we have to define the difference between weather and meteorology. What do we call it? The ancient Greeks actually christened the study of the atmosphere as meteorologica. So we're basically studying meteorons things in the atmosphere. That could be raindrops, hailstones, or snowflakes. And man, we've had a lot of snowflakes lately. For a while, you couldn't buy an inch of snow, now it's for sale. I mean, we've had 34 inches of snow um, so far this season, and about 95% of that has fallen since the 25th of January. So we've quickly eradicated whatever snow deficit we had. And if those of you in the Chicagoland area, I know we are talking to people from other parts of the United States, but for those of you in Chicago area watching the snowflakes fall yesterday, that was one of the more impressive events because it was literally a 40 to one ratio. We were getting four inches of snow uh, with basically a 10th of an inch of water. That's what happens when the atmosphere is this cold. So, Meteorology is a, is a science of naturally produced objects falling from the sky. When you talk about weather though, weather is actually the state of the atmosphere 
at a particular time and a particular place. So um, clear skies tonight. We did have some clouds earlier. Uh, temperature generally right around eight degrees to get local weather conditions. I have a link there. I'm sure uh, Bob can share this PowerPoint with you later. I like to make my presentations very interactive so that you know exactly where to go to get something if all of a sudden something pops up into your mind. I have this link on my phone. That's what, how much of a weather geek I am, but I don't care. That's who we are. Uh, climate is long-term. Weather is short-term, climate is long-term. So climate is a long-term state of the atmosphere at a particular location, which is really weather expressed as extremes and in averages, okay? So when someone says, Rick, I'm going to Florida in late April, they ask me, what is the weather? What they're really asking me is what is the climate typically in that area? Um, a farmer who wants to change over a crop will not so much ask about the weather or the climate, but then be concerned about the extremes. What is the driest it's ever been? What is the hottest it's ever been? Because at that point, they're concerned about a short period of extreme weather that could either damage or kill their crop. Sometimes the averages don't really mean much to a farmer. If you say you're gonna get average rainfall this year, but it comes all in the first two weeks, that's not very helpful for the farmer. In aviation, averages and extremes really don't play that big of an importance in short-term weather, but it certainly plays a role in where you wanna build, say, an airport. For a mariner, averages and extremes plays a huge role from a standpoint of when does the lake breeze season kick in? What has been the highest waves on the south end of Lake Michigan with a deep low over southern Michigan? So all of these things make sense because when you begin to kind of plan out a trip or figure out how are you going to do things in your job, you usually use averages and extremes as kind of like your guardrails um, or your overpasses. At what point is this weather too bad where we have to get out of this area? Think about the mariners from 100 years ago. They literally knew what was in their brain from, say, the last 10 or 15 years that uh, they were sailing. That was their average. That was their extreme. All right? They didn't have the um, option or the luxury of looking it up like we do now. So when we think about climate, think of climate as normal conditions over 30-year average. So for, for instance, for today, normal high at O'Hare, February 9th, 32 degrees. The record low, minus 18. So when we got to zero this morning, I told my students, I'm like, that's not that cold. And it looked at me like I had a third eye. I go, really, cold? Cold is 18 below. Cold is a 25 to 30 degree below zero wind chill, all right? It wasn't that cold today. Even though the afternoon high got up to about 17 degrees, that's a lot warmer than seven and a lot warmer than minus seven. So you have to start thinking about extremes and high degrees of variability when you're teaching students or trying to get them to understand some sort of perspective. Most of the time, weather's perspective, as you all know, is gained by being within the situation or just being able to uh, define certain things that kind of make sense to you in the short term. You begin to develop um, almost like a, a library or a reference of past cases. So when you look at a map here, this is just a normal graph of temperatures for the state of Illinois, pretty much for a season, winter some, from 1895. And you can pretty much see that that green line has a little bit of an uptick there. So we could basically surmise by looking at this that there has been a slight uptick in the average temperature in the state of Illinois for the winter season. And that's it, that's all we're looking at here. Two things right in front of you, okay? You can't argue this because the science is there, but you can argue about why it's there or you can argue about what to do so that it doesn't continue to go up. And the word argument doesn't mean you're yelling. There's many arguments in map rooms on whether or not a storm is gonna go south or whether or not a storm is gonna go north. But those arguments are based on scientific fact, past events, um, and the ability for the numerical models to handle a situation well. So again, there's nothing better than getting in a map room and discussing weather that deals with science. When people start to yell and scream at each other and call each other names, that's when the argument has become um, petty and punitive. And that doesn't normally happen in weather class. It never, never really does. 
So here's an example of an hourly surface map. Most of you have seen these. Um, there's going to be a couple of questions on things like a station model. So a station model is basically a graphical depiction of what the actual air temperature, dew point temperature, wind direction, wind speed, cloud cover, sometimes the height of the ceiling, the visibility, the type of precipitation or the air pressure, which is taken from the automatic surface observation system, otherwise known as ASOS. Now we also have reports or um, weather reports that are extracted from either buoys or ships, or as you know, um, coastal marine sites. So one up here at Winthrop Harbor, one down here at Wilmette Harbor. Um, I ride my bike, I take my dog over to Wilmette Harbor all the time, and I'm always looking up at their weather equipment because that's obviously really, really important stuff on what type of weather is occurring at the shoreline. But as you all know, it's very different when you get out into the middle of the lake. So this is basically a surface map from the College of DuPage that has all that information on here. So I mentioned the station model. The red number is the temperature. The one on the bottom left is the dew point. That's in green. The rest of the information on here at this point is probably not um, significant to this class at this time. So state of the atmosphere, as we talked about it, has a bunch of different elements to it. Air pressure for a meteorologist is the most important. Air pressure for normal people is not important. But is air pressure important to mariners? Yeah, if you're able to follow the trends, all right? But most of the time, people on boats don't really think about air pressure. People on airplanes think about it all the time. You have to set your altimeter. You have to know whether or not you need a different length of runway based on density altitude, but mariners do everything on sea level. So that pretty much is off the table as far as whether or not it's going to be a significant player for anybody working, obviously, um, in the Coast Guard. Air temperature, big thing, is it changing? Um, how does it change when you go from the coast into the middle of a large body of water like Lake Michigan? It can clearly drop 30 degrees, particularly in late March, early April, when the lake water temperature is say 45 and the wind coming off the water is like say 80 degrees. That happens very, very often, especially when the winds are light. Um, so temperature, wind, humidity, cloud cover are all the things that occur when you have variations in the vertical levels of the atmosphere that mix things up, that lift the air, that condense it, and that cause precipitation. Uh, but the type and amount will obviously dictate visibility, or maybe not. Sometimes when you have a dense fog bank, there's nothing better than a shower of rain to basically coalesce the raindrops or the fog droplets to the point where you go from an eighth of a mile visibility to a mile. So anytime that you can understand how weather could help you makes you a better observer and a better predictor of the weather. You may not call yourself a forecaster, but to me, anybody who looks at weather maps day to day and understands trends, you're a weather forecaster. Do you have a degree in meteorology? No, but can you predict the weather based on the, 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 the atmosphere at that point forward? Yes. So don't let anybody ever take that away from you. Uh, two different ways that we measure the atmosphere. The first one is with, the, is with contact measuring devices, anemometer, wind vane, um, temperature, uh, thermometer, um, hygrometer, which is going to measure uh, the dew point temperature, uh, barometer, which measures air pressure. All of these things help us understand um, the ability to measure weather events, particularly uh, small scale events. So we'll talk a little bit about macro, micro, and meso coming up. Um, satellites are probably the most important meteorological observing device that we've had, um, or at least the advances of it, in the last 15 years. When I was going to school, and Bob as well, I remember waiting for that piece of paper coming out of the Univax machine that basically showed us clumpy layers of clouds from two hours ago. And part of it was because it was pretty much under government um, jurisdiction on how much they wanted you to see uh, the rest of the earth. I think they called that classified. Now you have access to any satellite anywhere in the world um, and make good use of it. Matter of fact, I've seen some of the best forecasts done, particularly along uh, coastal areas, by observing dense fog banks or stratus banks moving south along the shoreline of Lake Michigan and knowing quite well with a certain type of wind 
or a certain type of temperature contrast, how that air mass or that fog bank will actually get pulled inward and southward and literally go from six to seven miles visibility with the southwest wind at Milwaukee Harbor to say a quarter of a mile with the wind out of the northeast to 30 miles an hour. And all of a sudden you got three to four foot waves. Um, and understanding also that that'll eventually thin out and give you at least some better weather, but knowing that, that a change came through. I've seen so many times when people get caught out on the lake because they just weren't paying attention to the weather. So what causes the weather? Basically, we know that it, our heat comes from the sun, 93 million miles away, but it's amazing how little heat we actually get all the way down to the, sur the Earth's surface. So we know obviously that the sun is extremely large and has a tremendous amount of heat energy because it's so big and so hot, it provides what we call potential energy. So not only does the, does the Earth receive the energy, but we receive it in an uneven way. And that's really key. So two principal motions, rotation and revolution. Rotation, as we all know, relates to the day-to-day -day changes. Revolution relates to the seasonal changes. One rotation is a day, nearly 24 hours. One revolution is a year, nearly 365 days. A uh, famous scientist by the name of Milankovitch theorized that the Earth always or didn't always turn at the same tilt or at the same speed or at the same orbitable distance from the sun, therefore allowing the Earth to go into these um, long changes of seasons, which was either an ice age or maybe a warming of the planet. So 65 to about 135 million years ago, this planet was nearly 12 degrees warmer than it was right now. Was it due to Milankovitch cycles? Partly it was but it was probably more so due to the fact that this Earth was still a very angry planet. Uh, plate tectonics, meaning that the Earth's crust was opening up, allowing a lot of that volcanic um, heat and uh, different types of uh, water vapor to empty the atmosphere, thus changing the overall temperature structure and putting us into a situation where, yeah, we basically had tropical rainforest going all the way up to about 65, degrees latitude. And with that, with the absence of humans, animals ruled. So for a long period of time, this Earth was a very, very warm planet that rendered the type of environment that was conducive to basically dinosaurs roaming the Earth with, no, with nothing that was literally going to take them off the planet. They had no predators. They had no enemies, okay, until a little asteroid hit somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico. So how did this all start? Well, four and a half billion years ago, Earth kind of started out as a little rock, third rock from the sun, if you want to call it that, if you remember that funny TV show. But for really the first billion and a half years or so, there wasn't much going on. Not until the stromatolites began to uh, basically break up um, a combination of water into oxygen, did the Earth really begin to have somewhat of an atmosphere. But it really wasn't until all of these continents kind of got stuck in place about 65 million years ago, did we really have what we call modern day climate, right? So even though we had the dinosaurs around and we had a couple of ice ages here and here, the Earth's modern day climate really didn't start until about 60, 65 million years ago. That's very, that's very short compared to the life of the planet. Again, four and a half billion years ago. But when the Earth finally said, you know what, I'm, I'm stable, I'm going to be tilted at about 23 and a half degrees, I'll stay anywhere between 92 and 94 million miles from the sun. And as long as the sun produces a certain amount of what we call TSI, total solar irradiance, the amount of energy reaching the Earth will be the same at a certain plane, okay? So if you see where my mouse is, if I put a plane right about here, the same amount of energy hits the top of the plane as the bottom of the plane as the middle of the plane. However, that's not what happens on the Earth's surface. The Earth is round. You can see the incoming sunlight here hits at about a 90 degree angle. Up here, it hits at a much, much lower angle. And because the Earth is tilted, the angle of declination is gonna determine how much sunlight you get during a certain time of the year. 
So for Chicago, we're at about 42 degrees north, but because the earth is tilted at 23 and a half, you actually have to add 23 to that 42 to get the actual angle that the sunlight is hitting us. So 42 and 23, last I checked, is about 65. You subtract that from 90, you get about a 25 degree angle of the sun on the first day of winter. All right, I'm not gonna quiz you on that part, but that just kind of shows you how different the amount of insulation is on a high latitude site compared to coming all the way down here to the equator, all right? So the amount of sunlight or the amount of radiation would be the same on a flat plane. It is much, much different way to the north and then also way to the south. So for instance, say you go all the way up to Reykjavik, Iceland. I was there for two weeks back in 2017. Uh, I was there teaching the class and we were there from the 26th of June to about the 10th of July. And on the 26th of June, sun set at about 11.45 and it rose at about 1.45. Had about 22 hours of sunlight. But because the sun was still on a very low angle, it didn't really ever get that hot. Even though the sun, the sun light was present for 22 hours, it was on a very low angle, therefore relative to what we have down here in the United States. And one of the things that was really quite amazing is the sun was maybe 10 degrees above the horizon for almost three hours before it finally set. And even when it set, it never got dark. So if you really want to see the interaction of the sun and the earth and why we have seasons and why different parts of the earth have much warmer temperatures and different parts of the earth have much cooler temperatures, go to Iceland. It's about as cool as it can get. All right, so let's discuss sunlight and the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is the portion of the visible light. This is not a physics class. I'm not gonna go into all the different um, wave energy wavelengths or things like that. But as a meteorologist in your first quote, quote, core course, you have to suffer through this. So while you're listening to the professor, blah, 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 this, you're dreaming of whether or not that front's gonna come through with enough moisture, it's gonna produce a couple of severe thunderstorms. And as soon as that lecture is done, you run to the map room on the 14th floor. Bob knows exactly what I'm talking about. So the bottom line is heat energy from the sun and the earth um, cause us to have you know, either, either seasons on a longer term or a warm day on the shorter term. Bottom line, cooler objects emit mostly longer wavelength radiation, including visible light, thermal infrared, radio, and also microwaves. The hottest objects in the universe radiate mostly gamma rays and x-rays. Bottom line is, the hotter something is, the shorter its peak wavelength of radiated energy is. So generally speaking, we're gonna talk more about incoming sunlight, which is defined as short wave. And once that warmth reaches the Earth's surface and goes back out into the atmosphere, it is defined as long wave. Long wave is actually what it's also referred to as infrared, whereas incoming is referred to as short wave. And you'll sometimes hear meteorologists talk about infrared satellite imagery. So again, outgoing long wave or outgoing radiation is long wave. One of the good ways of remembering that is on a hot summer day, the letter L kind of refers to the word lazy. Okay, I've always, I've always told students different ways of remembering things before you learn it and you never forget it. So before I was talking about the fact that the axis of the earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, um, if you forget that number, just think of Michael Jordan, uh, Ryan Sandberg, or Devin Hester. Okay, all those athletes wore the number 23. So here is the sun's rays coming in at a certain point on the first day of winter, all right? And literally right at this point where you have 23 and a half degrees, you subtract 90 from that, and you now have the Arctic Circle, all right? So the Arctic Circle is 66.5 degrees. What's nice about that is the same holds true for the Southern Hemisphere, okay? So you have your Antarctic Circle down here, but on our first day of winter, this is their first day of summer. So anywhere north of that 66.5 uh, degree line, you don't have any sunlight. Anywhere south of that 66.5 of that south line, you have no nightlight. You have basically all sun. But again, it's coming at a very low angle. 
So the bottom line is the Earth rotates on an axis and revolves around the sun in an elliptical orbit. Think about this as an Indy race car. When the Earth is moving through this part of the orbit here or moving through this part of the orbit here, it moves pretty quickly. When it gets to the end point here or the end point here, it begins to slow down. That's because it has to turn. So for the period of time between about June 15th and about July 15th, the Earth is almost in the same place relative to the sun for about a month. That's why we call the term solstice, sun standing still. That's why between June 15 and about July 15, the sunlight is literally the same for about a month. Similar in the wintertime between about December 10th and about January the 15th, we're in the winter solstice. For that period of time, the sun is literally in the sky for about the same amount of time. Now we're about probably here, and you've noticed if you're living in Chicago, we're gaining about a minute and a half to almost two minutes of sun a day. And that will actually increase as we get to the point where we have what's called the equinox. Equinox meaning equal nights. So the autumnal equinox and the vertical equinox, everywhere on planet Earth, you basically have the same amount of sunlight. It is one of the coolest things in the world. Doesn't mean that your twilight is the same, but it definitely means you have about the same amount of sunlight, okay? I'm just checking on my time here, all right? Hey, Bob, just give me like an update of how much time I have left. So it gives me a little bit better understanding, okay? Okay, Rick, you're doing fine. All right, so question is, how does sunlight equate to heat and energy? Energy basically is the capacity to do work. Um, if you've ever looked at physics equations, work is force times distance. So if someone is moving themselves, force equals mass times acceleration. Over a certain amount of distance, you're now creating work. However, if you have no energy, you don't wanna do any work. Same thing with the atmosphere. The atmosphere has no energy. It could not do any work. So a morning like today, where we had basically clear skies and light winds, there was really nothing to really lift the atmosphere, but there was also no water vapor. It was a very dry atmosphere. But if we would have had water vapor in the atmosphere, most of that would have either frozen on contact, or if it was above freezing, it would have created fog. So think of water vapor as the powder that you put in a drink, like say if you're making iced tea or Kool-Aid or you know chocolate milk. If you don't stir it up, it sinks to the bottom. Okay, so water vapor is like the powder at that particular point. So those of us who pretty much got through high school probably had a basic physics class, and we all know that energy comes in two forms, kinetic and potential, right? Kinetic energy is basically energy that refers to movement. Think of the word kinesiology. So if the molecules of the substance are moving, it has some degree of kinetic energy. And think of the word degree as not relating to temperature. Degree is just the word that has a subjective interpretation of how much something is. That quarterback has a certain degree of confidence. That model has a certain degree of style, okay? You're basically subjective interpreting how much something they have by using the word degree. So when you think about it, when we talk about temperature, it really is a degree of kinetic energy. So when we refer to the average kinetic energy of the molecules of a substance, we call it temperature. Temperature is really not a degree so much of heat, but it's a degree of kinetic energy. It's a degree of how much the molecules are moving in a certain environment. Now, depending on how many molecules you have, will then determine how much heat is coming out of that, all right? So even at minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the atmosphere has a certain degree of temperature. Granted, it's a small degree. Now that's up, that's up to interpretation personally, but it still has a certain degree of kinetic energy, all right? So again, temperature is defined as the average kinetic energy of the molecules of a, sub, of a substance or the degree of potential heat energy. Now we kind of put two different words there. Potential meaning how much energy can come out of that and how much energy comes out of that in the form of heat. Even at minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, there is a certain degree of potential heat energy. Why? Because we're not at absolute zero, okay? That's a conversation for another time. But those of you who um, do work on Lake Michigan, 
know quite well that when you get to the end of August, that lake has a lot of heat capacity and therefore has a lot of degree of potential heat energy. It's one of the reasons why the lake breeze dies once you get to the end of, of um, August. The lake is too warm. It doesn't create any sort of temperature difference between inland and along the shoreline. All right. So again, temperature is the average kinetic energy of the molecules of a substance, commonly referred to as the degree of hotness or coldness. The word hotness or coldness is not something you'll find in the American Meteorological Glossary of Scientific Definitions. Heat and cold, you will, or hot and cold, you will, but not coldness or not hotness. All right, so what about these scales we always talk about? Kelvin, centigrade, Fahrenheit. I mentioned Kelvin before, because that's what scientists use to represent when molecules are not moving. In other words, absolute zero. Uh, quite honestly, I never teach these. I never do. I teach my students to remember zero is 32, 10 is 50, 20 is 68, 30 is 86, 40 is 104, all right? So if you go up 10 on the centigrade scale and 18 on the Fahrenheit scale, that means if you go up five on the centigrade scale, you go up nine on the Fahrenheit scale. Learn that, learn that zero is 32, and for every 10 you go up, you go up 18. You're golden after that, okay? So we all know that zero degrees centigrade is freezing. That's basically when pure ice melts. That's one way of thinking about it, right? Remember that, by the way, for one of those review questions. 100 degrees is boiling, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is freezing, 212 is boiling, all right? Everything that I do in the field of meteorology on the surface is in Fahrenheit. Everything I do in the upper air is all in centigrade, all right? So again, heat versus temperature. Again, I mentioned the word that temperature, or the, rather the temperature, is the average kinetic energy of the molecules of a substance. But heat then is how much of that energy is transferred between systems that have different temperature. And I always tell my students, take your hand and touch a really hot plate. And they'll go, why? They'll touch it. See how long your hand stays there. Probably about a nanosecond, all right? So the degree of difference between those two substances will dictate how fast you pull your hand up, okay? Same thing with something that's cold because it's a different, it's such, it's such a colder substance relative to your hand that you're gonna pull it away, okay? So again, temperature is the degree of kinetic energy. Heat is the difference of temperature between those two systems. Why? Because when you have two things of different degrees of energy, one is gonna give up to the other one until they basically form an equilibrium. So the transfer of energy then moves from the air from one place to another. It can move either in a convective way, it can move either through a conductive way, or it can move through radiation, okay? The movement of heat energy is basically called thermodynamics. So when you see object number one is warm and object number two is cool, one's gonna give up the heat until two and one are basically the same. This is what's called a lake breeze. Lake breezes are basically a transfer of heat, but is it the transfer of heat of the lake to the air, or is the air literally pulling the air from the lake inward? It's probably more of that. It's also the shape of the lake and also the synoptic scale systems as well. So again, energy is referred to um, as a transfer mechanism, convection, conduction, and radiation. So radiation is basically the electromagnetic radiation that comes all the way down to the Earth's atmosphere, all the way down to the surface from the sun. Conduction is actually a very, very small part of meteorology, not more than maybe the first 10 feet is through conduction. Everything else is basically through convection, which is the up and down motion of air. Remember, you can have both upwards and downward convection, but most people think of convection as a form of upward vertical motion. Why? Because we're always thinking of clouds. Conduction is basically solid to solid. I touched the radio, that's hot. But when you walked into a room, you felt it through radiation, okay? So even though radiation is defined as electromagnetic waves coming from the sun, you walk into a room and you go, wow, it's warm. That's kind of radiation. It's kind of a little bit of both there. But basically in this class, think of convection as the vertical transport of heat, advection is actually referred to as horizontal. More on that later. All right, getting back to short wave and long wave. Again, short wave, a little bit of review here. 
comes all the way down to the Earth's surface. Some of it is blocked by clouds. Some of it is reflected by clouds. It's different. Some of it is absorbed by the atmosphere. Some of it basically hits the Earth and bounces back up and then comes back down, all right? That part there gives us what we, are, what we realize as a balanced global energy budget. From all the sunlight coming into the Earth's surface, only about half actually reaches the Earth's surface. It's actually not that much. So the fact that we have an atmosphere is good because it blocks out not only the harmful UV rays of the sun, but it keeps us alive. Otherwise, if we had no atmosphere, we would get really, really hot during the day and really, really cold at night. This is called the greenhouse effect. Meteorologists like to call it the atmosphere effect, but basically the greenhouse effect takes whatever sunlight's coming in, blocks it, warms up the top of the troposphere, and then really radiates the atmosphere in the troposphere to the point where we can have life on this planet. So bottom line, outgoing long wave radiation from the surface of the earth is absorbed by the atmosphere. Part of that goes back down to the surface and due to the fact that the atmosphere has a fair amount of water vapor and carbon dioxide, those two gases are really good at absorbing outgoing long wave radiation. And because of that, our Earth's atmosphere is about 59 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Without it, we'd be freezing, basically down to zero. So again, I mentioned these two gases. Water vapor makes up anywhere between two and 4% of the Earth's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, much less, but CO2 is also a very powerful absorber of outgoing long wave radiation. And because of that, the atmosphere has warmed up quite a bit, almost 1.9 degrees Fahrenheit since 1880. So humans have actually had a pretty decent impact on the Earth's um, atmosphere from that standpoint, okay? All right. How does this then relate to the global circulation? Well, first of all, if you look at the equator, anything that you get more heat of towards the equatorial areas are gonna warm up more, okay? Any place where you get less of is not gonna warm up as much. So the Earth's atmosphere actually spreads up and outward to the north and down and outward to the south. Once you take the Earth and then tilt it, that's gonna actually have a bit of a spin to the air, okay? So first off, let's talk about what happens within some of those, quote, cells. First off, when you heat up the air, the air pressure gets less because you have less molecules. So that air wants to rise. When you cool the air down, that air sinks and presses down on the surface and diverges. Diverging air does not allow clouds to be lifted in a large scale fashion. Low pressure allows the air to converge and does allow the air to rise. So generally speaking, we look at areas of low pressure as regions of precipitation and areas high pressure as regions of less precipitation, all right? You can still get rain and high, you just don't get that much. So right along the equatorial regions, we have these areas of low pressure. They basically move from west to east, north and south a little bit depending on the time of the year. But if you average it all out, you actually get a three cell circulation where the air goes up at the equator and then sinks somewhere between about 30, 20 and 30 degrees north and sinks at about 20 to 30 degrees south. Also notice the way the circulation moves. It moves in a clockwise fashion here, here and here. Whereas in the southern hemisphere, it moves in a counterclockwise fashion, all right? Chapter two is, is gonna go more into why it turns to the left or why it turns to the right. But the shape of these continents and the ocean currents have literally dictated since about 60 million years ago, the overall biomes and world climate zones that we have today. So the largest area of sinking motion over a landmass resides over North Africa. That's a desert. The second largest is somewhere in the Middle East. The third largest would be out here in the desert southwest. The largest area of dry weather in the Southern Hemisphere is over Australia. Second largest is Southern Africa. Third is down here in South America. Deserts are not at equators. Deserts are between about 20 and about 30 degrees north latitude. Rainforests, though, are at the largest areas where you can able to have air that gets heated, pulls the air in from either side, moisture obviously converges, 
along those boundaries, creating either seasonal precipitation or interseasonal precipitation, meaning monsoons. Largest landmass underneath that, Amazon rainforest, second one, the Congo, third, Indonesia. All right. There's um, three weeks or three weeks of meteorology uh, condensed into about three sentences. All right. So what I find so cool about the continent of Africa, it has not only the second largest rainforest, but it has the largest desert on the same continent. You can go for a drive. It'll probably take you a couple of days with all the winding roads and literally go from a rainforest to desert on the same landmass. And that's basically because of the way Africa is bisected from both North to South hemispheres. That's pretty cool stuff. So Coriolis effect, I mentioned this before, um, from a standpoint of how the Earth's uh, large scale patterns are twisted. Coriolis force, and this will be one of the review questions, generally means that if you're trying to go from the equator to the North Pole, the Earth turning will actually force the air to move to the right. In the southern hemisphere, it forces the air to move to the left. What's really cool about this is the air over a long period of time wants to go from the equator northward, but it can't, so it gets twisted off to the right. Over a long period of time, the air wants to go from the equator to the south pole. It can't, so it gets twisted to the left. So you can see very quickly, the airflow in the northern hemisphere wants to travel from west to east, the airflow in the Southern Hemisphere wants to travel from west to east. That means that the jet stream in the mid latitudes between 30 and 50 degrees north, both are westerly flows in both hemispheres. That's really cool. And that's because of the Coriolis effect. So basically the Coriolis effect only works on large scale, um, large scale flow patterns, but it actually has an effect as well even on some of the big uh, storms that we had moved through the United States. Large scale areas of low pressure have the air tilted a certain way due to the Coriolis force and high pressure systems are the same way. So we have three different types. The snow that fell yesterday in the Chicago area was definitely not macro scale, but the big area high pressure that we have from Canada all the way down into mid part of the United States is macro scale. These are really, really large, really easy to forecast because you can see them two, 3, 000, two to 3,000 miles away. Two to 3,000 miles away, two to three days. Mesoscale was literally something that came through here yesterday, where we had a five to six hour period of snow, and we got four inches of snow with about a tenth of an inch of water. You try to forecast that two days from now, you'll be wrong 90% of the time. So it's best to follow trends, kind of like a lake breeze, kind of like a sea breeze, kind of like a fog bank moving down Lake Michigan. All right, looking at observations in the short term and determining is it increasing, is it decreasing, is it spreading out, is it converging on the west side of the lake? What part of the lake is it going to be safer to travel on, the west side or the east side, given certain type of situations? Most of you probably know that a little bit if you have at least two or three years experience being on the lake, but trust me, the more you look at the combination of meso and micro and are able to figure out some of those finer details, you're going in the right direction. Okay. All right. So with that said, 754, I'm going to finish up because I know Bob wanted me to go about 40 minutes. And I think I've exhausted my time. There are some review questions here, but I'll leave those up to Bob. Bob, it's all yours. All right. Great job, Rick. Uh, thank you very much. And you know, if you guys want to react uh, to Rick's wonderful presentation, if you've used Zoom before, on the bottom part there it says recreation. If you scroll, or Rick reactions, and you can give them the thumbs up or the clap uh, sign there because we, we can't really get a chance to do that here on the bottom. You scroll over there. So uh, we really, there's no other way to tell them thank you without everybody turning their microphones off. Um, I had some housekeeping items real quick before we get into the review questions. Uh, Bob Musco, is anybody in Bob Musco's flotilla? Because we lost him there. All right, good. Um, Harold, what's your last name? If you could unmute yourself, Harold. Harold Schley. Huh? Oh, hey, Harry. How are you, buddy? Good, <laughs> good to see you here. Um, 
And if you called in on a telephone, I want to make sure I note that you're participating. Is 312-622, who is that that is on their phone? Can you unmute? Or is there any way to you, for you to do that? All right. All right, team. Here we go. Give me just a minute here, and I'm going to start. Uh, on the bottom of your screen, Rick, it says stop sharing. So if you could go to the bottom of your screen where it says stop sharing. Yep where it says share screen and go to stop sharing. All done, stop sharing. All right, good. So I'm gonna dig around here for just a minute and try to find my file here with the quiz questions on it. Uh oh. Are those the same review questions, Bob, in the- um, The uh, Yeah, do you have the handout? Um, well, if you want, you can pull up that PowerPoint. They're all loaded up there for you. Well, I was going to shrink it, but since I'm recording it, it won't allow it to do it. Can you do that for me? Because yeah, uh, I haven't recorded a meeting before, and I'm recording this one. Um, uh, you said do what? You want me to show the questions that you gave me? Um, do you have, yeah, from the bottom of the, uh, and go to the very, yeah. So I can, if you want, you can make me share screen again. All right, is it, yeah, I need to do that, huh? Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Sorry. That's all right. All right. Well, there you are. We, are is that you sharing screen or are you sharing your screen? All right. Here we go. Now, not that I'm picking on anybody, which I am. Uh, Adam Rock, Rockos. How do you say your name, Adam? Rockos? Oh, it's Rokas. Rokas. All right. Number one, the electromagnetic energy that comes from the sun consists of? E, all the above. Excellent. Good job, Adam. Alejandro, number two. The amount of energy per unit area that arrives at the top of the atmosphere from the sun. What do you think, Alejandro? Uh, decreases with increased latitude. Very good. And you get that? You know, at the end of your student uh, uh, study guide, all the answers are all the way in the back, in case you can't figure that out. Uh, and, and Alex Carmichael, number three. Hey, Bob. Uh, just yeah, go ahead. Real quickly. Who is um, it? This is Rick. Hey, Rick. Um, so there, there's two slides. The first slide has the questions on it, and then the second one has the answer highlighted in yellow, okay? Nice. Okay. And we'll go through them before highlighting that. We'll, we'll see if they studied. Alex Carmichael, the largest swings of hot and cold are? C, with the seasons. With the seasons. Everybody get that? Well done. Amanda McAllister, number four. With the same heat input, which heats faster? This is a good one. I hope you were listening when uh, Rick told you this. Um, land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Everybody get that? Next one. Well done. Anita Lutkus, the amount, the amount of solar energy that is absorbed by the Earth's surface is reduced due to? D, both B and C. Correct. Yeah. It's not A because the distance is uh, uh, minuscule in comparison, so it really has a lot more to do with uh, the nature of the surface and reflection from the clouds. Well done, Anita. And Brink, uh, what was that? Go ahead. Uh, um. the, the energy, um, the amount of energy, it came up on different answers. It didn't say with the seasons. It said with the latitude. Oh, yeah, that, was, that, was, that was my fault there. That was my fault. Okay, so it's oh. D. You see that? Is that Kenneth? Is that you asking the question? No, this was Jeff Silberg. Oh, hey, Jeff. Yeah. So can you see now that it's D? On this one, I could, but I'm just saying that the amount of energy that is absorbed, the difference is there was a few slides back that yeah. with it, longitude. It should, that uh, was, that with was seasons. wrong on my part. Three should be oh, seasons. Okay. Oh, yeah, that was an error. Good catch. Good catch, Jeff. You're paying okay. attention. Somebody write <laughs> down extra points for Jeff. Good job. <laughs> Thanks for catching that, Rick. Uh, the next one is for Ann Brink. The specific heat of a substance is... Everybody was asked to study their uh, books there. You, you can say pass if you want to, Ann. Are you there, Ann? Yep, I'm here. Can you, you hear me? This? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah, you just unmuted. What do you, what's the answer here? You remember this one from the text? The amount of energy it can hold. Uh, no, they're looking for something else because, uh, like, it's an amount of it, amount of, uh, Arcia, what do you think for this one? Uh, I believe it's uh, D. 
Yeah, so if you are going to increase the temperature of water one degree Celsius, that is a, that's the uh, rate of temperature increase. So that's the specific heat that you've increased it. Yeah, so yeah, dig that around through your text and you should see it. Good job, Arcia. Uh, Bill Russell, I'm gonna pick on you. You thought you were an innocent bystander in this. <laughs> the air in the lower atmosphere is heated mainly by, <laughs> he wasn't ready. <laughs> you wanna answer, Bill, you wanna pass. I won't make you do it. <laughs> yeah? All right, I'll, we'll pass you. Bill Vahey, take a shot at number seven. Um, delta. Conduction and convection from the Earth's surface. Everybody get that, D? Very good, good job, Bill. Uh, Bob Musco, are you here? I think you got kicked off somehow. Did you get back in? Uh, no, hey, Bob, this is Rodney. Hey, Rodney. Hey, no, he left. He was just stopping in to, to see how you ran the class. Okay, number eight, Rodney. Temperature may be defined as a measure of kinetic energy of molecules. There you go. Nicely done. Everybody get that? <laughs> nice job, Rodney. Uh, Chris Strawman, in the Celsius temperature scale, zero is defined as? Nothing going through water. Yeah. Why isn't it salt water? Do you know that one, Chris? I knew you knew this one, so. Why isn't, do you know why it isn't salt did somebody water? Answer, did somebody answer for me? I didn't give an answer yet. Well, who <laughs> was that? Was that Chris? Which Chris? Strawman? Oh, there's two different Chris's. My yeah, bad. I didn't give an answer. All right. Well, whoever, whoever answered for Chris, nice job. And don't jump in again. <laughs> we'll give you the next one, Chris. Uh, number uh, 10. Go ahead. Uh, 20 degrees Celsius is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Very good. Thanks, Chris. Sorry about that. Don no, Bratton, please. number 11. 59 degrees Fahrenheit is in Celsius to the nearest degree. 15 degrees. Excellent, 15, well done. Deb Salvi, number 12. The transfer of heat by the horizontal movement of air is? <laughs> you wanna pass? You can pass. Michael Harvey, is there a way for you to stop your camera or no? There's no way for you to do that? It's advection. Convection, very yeah. good. No, uh, yeah, horizontal, you're right, advection. I'm sorry, yeah, I was thinking advection. of vertical. You're, you're right, uh, advection. So C, everybody get that 12 is C? You know how to do that, Michael? If you don't, just leave it, it's no big deal. That right. Mike Harvey? Gary Cahill, the transfer of heat between bodies that are not in, in contact is? Radiation. Radiation, good. Everybody get that? C, good. Harry, you're on deck. In meteorology, convection means? Upward. Is that you, Harry? Hey, stop answering if you're naming Harry. Come on now. <laughs> you got this one, Harry? Want to say pass? Yeah, pass. <laughs> Was that Harry Schlehan? No, Bob, you should call me Harold. I'm sorry, Harold, my bad. You're not going to let me get in the slip next to you over at uh, Belmont Harbor this year if I stop messing up, right? <laughs> Go uh, ahead, Harold. Montrose. What's that? That's Montrose. Montrose. You're at Montrose? Yeah. Oh, good. It's cheaper at Montrose. I can afford that. <laughs> meteorology convection means? The horizontal movement of air by winds. That's so, it. in a convection oven, what direction does the heat go? Does it go side to side or up and down? Up and down. So, vertical is up and down, right? Like, just think of a convection oven when you see this on the quiz. So, sorry, D, vertical transport of heat by air. Yeah, I, I threw you off earlier when I talked about advection. Advection, horizontal, convection, up and down. Good, Harold, sorry about that. Jane Bickle, radiation and energy is energy transfer... I had a hard time with uh, the radiation is energy transfer uh, in a waveform. Yep, very good. You didn't have any trouble at all. Is that you, Jane? Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're killing it. Good job. 16, Jason Pfeffer, large land masses as opposed to the oceans. It's uh, C, change temperature more between night and day. 
Good. Diurnal variation is another word for that. Very good. Good job, uh, Jason. Jeff Silberg. Oh, you had answered already, didn't you? Jessica McAllister, the cause of most weather phenomena is? D, uneven heating of the Earth's surface. Excellent. Good job. Good job, uh, Rick. Good teaching these folks. Uh, Jim Davey, for the station model shown below, the temperature reported is? This is for our class, you know, for our purposes. If it was 53, the, 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 the houses would be melting. Yeah, no, it's C, 53. Yeah, C is correct. 53 degrees Fahrenheit. John Puskar, the Coriolis effect. What was that, John? Bravo, increases with increasing wind speed. Very good. Where else does it increase? Do you remember? Now far, uh, farther north. Farther uh, north. Right. Good. Farther north. No, I thought it would be south. Okay. Nope. All right. Did I get All that right? right? Did I get that back? Yeah, it increases yeah, with increasing latitudes. Yeah, farther north. The, the All right, John Vandra. All right, good job. The force, guys, is zero at the equator, by the way. That's why there's no hurricanes at the equator. Good. John Vandra, number 20. The winds near the equator are called? A, trade winds. A, trade winds. Trade winds. Trade winds. Trade winds. All right, and if I don't call you, don't don't have your your. Go ahead and mute yourself. I'm hearing an echo. Go ahead. You said a trade winds, right? Roger. Go ahead, uh, Rick. Kevin, well, Kevin, can you answer? Or are you on your phone there? On a rotating smooth Earth. Uh oh, where we go? Sorry about that. I don't have um. Uh, <laughs> it's already it's already highlighted here. <laughs> Was that Kevin? No, it's Rick. The, I, oh, sorry, Rick. I, I, I highlighted this already. Sorry about that. No, no, that's all right. Uh, all right, Kevin, this is going to be an easy, easy one. On a rotating smooth earth, the low pressure bands parallel to the equator are the? If you get this wrong, I'm going to be very disappointed. I would assume A. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Are you on the cell phone tonight, or are you at a regular? I, I am, but I'm, I'm all good. All right, good job, uh, no, Kevin. No, Bob, go back to that. Uh, go back one, uh, please, Rick. What do you see, Rodney? What is it? Are you a, a, a doldrums and subpolar low? No. Yeah, it's C. Oh, wait a minute. It is C. Yeah. Now, is that why you got? Is that why you had technical difficulties? Everybody, the answer. Sorry about that, Kevin. I threw you off by telling you it was the right answer. <laughs> the doldrums and the subpolar low, right? Because those are the two low pressure bands that are parallel to the equator. One obviously is not far from the equator, but the subpolar low is way up on the on the pole on the pole. So yeah. now that's my bad because I never referred to it as subpolar. I, I referred to it as more the subtropical. So that's my that's my fault. Then. All right. All right. Good. Larry Lindbergh, uh, twenty two. The doldrums is a belt of relatively Charlie low pressure. Low pressure. Right. Oh wait, go back on that one. No, that's my fault. That's my fault. It is. It is low pressure, isn't it? Um, you know what? I I I think yeah, first off, I, I think that that's a bad question to be honest with you, mm -hmm. because the doldrums is just basically an area of weak wind, which can be associated with low or high pressure. You know what? And I you know I looked at that too, and I said this is a bad. One. The problem is. You may see this this one again, and if you do, students, the answer is called low pressure. It's, right. It should be more low pressure gradient, right, Rick? Because right. there's not, right? right? Well, but it's, it's better to say weak pressure gradient. Yeah. So anyways, if you see this again, though, it's yeah. going to be low pressure, students. Yeah. So yeah. Not, exactly. whoever wrote the, the textbook here, I'm not crazy about this question, but if you see it, you know what the no, answer is. It, it's not that the question is a bad question. It's the choices that they gave are not good. All righty. Who, who was the last one up? Larry Lindbergh, you got the next one? I cool. just had one, but You just whatever. had one. No, no, I'm, bug, <laughs> I'm going to bug somebody else. Good job, Larry. You, you did well. Linda Coppell, which of the following is not one of the primary wind belts? Sort of a trick question. Yeah. This is a trick question. Did you see this one, Linda? Are you there, Linda? <clears throat> I know, I know. Oh, no cheat. Hey. Oh, you yourself, Rodney. Polar westerlies. Yeah, why is that wrong, Linda? Do you know the answer right off the top of your head? 
No. <laughs> yeah. I want to. Who, who haven't I picked on lately? Let me see if Mario. Do you know why that's the wrong answer, Mario? Why is that wrong? Did you look Polar at your Easterlies? Is that Mario? Are you there, Mario? All righty. I, I guess he can't mute himself. That's okay. Mark Frankel, the Intertropical <laughs> Convergence Zone, IPC. Mario, oh, all right, Mario, you want to try this one? The Intertropical Convergence Zone is located. Uh, either side of the equator. D. Yeah, it can be either side depending on the season. Good job. Well done, Mario. Let's go get a boat. Next one, Mark Frankel. The trade winds. D. David. Blow from the horse latitudes, which is, uh, yeah, the higher pressure down to the lower pressure area of the doldrums. Good. Uh, Mark uh, Azam, so all vertical motion of air near the equator is caused by? V, heating the air by the Earth's surface. Now, that, that is one of the correct answers. However, it goes back to what Rick was saying there, okay. variation of solar energy with the latitude. So not only is the heating of the Earth's surface, but... It's hotter down there because it's a, a, at one of the low latitudes and the, the, the trade winds come, up, come in from either direction, again, causing that surface convergence and the rising. So it is all of the above. Good. Mike Haley, heat is transported northward and southward from the equator by? It's for Mike Haley. That would be D, both A and B. Good. Yeah, the wind and the water, wind and the ocean currents. Well done. Mike Harvey, insulation is? Mike Harvey, can you, are you muted still? You there, Mike Harvey? Uh, see? Oh, I'm sorry, what is it again, uh, Harvey? Mike Harvey? C? 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 Uh, insulation is... Yeah, that's that's right, right? Yeah. Yep. Good. Well done, Michael. Good job. Um, Mike Zindrick, number 29. An example of a synoptic scale phenomenon is... B, an air mass. Good. It's, it's, you know, bigger than just a tornado, and it's smaller than a global one, which would be C. Good. Everybody see that? Well done. Nick, an example of a mesoscale phenomenon is? Frontal system. Mesoscale. So what, what, go to oh, the okay. last question again, right? What was that? Was that Nick? Was that Nick? Yes. Okay, so you said A, good, yeah, thunderstorm. So mesoscale, Rick, why don't you talk about how, how small it is? Um, well, first off, um, you can think of an air mass as something that is attached to like a big low pressure system. That'd be like a warm air mass or a cold air mass. That's why we refer to it as synoptic. And then along those frontal zones, you can have the interaction of warm, moist air and cool, dry air, and that'll create your thunderstorm. And the reason why we call it mesoscale is it, it's a short duration of time that the thunderstorm is um, in existence, two, three, maybe four hours at best. And it also covers a very small area relative to the size of synoptic scale. So an air mass could linger for, you know, 36, 48, maybe 72 hours and can go all the way from the Gulf of Mexico into New England. Whereas a thunderstorm, you're going to have a hard time doing that. So again, um, synoptic scale is like macro, and then a thunderstorm would be like meso. And then the next scale would be what? Go ahead, uh, Bob. Yeah, so micro scale, right? So you got global, synoptic, meso scale, um, micro scale. Good. Right. Um, Pat Dugan, the trade winds are an example of? 
A, a global scale phenomenon. Very good. All the way around there, gold. Well done. Patrick Leonardi, number 32. Oh, well, that's the end. Good job, guys. Everybody's doing real good. It is like a uh, quarter after. Uh, the next chapter is shorter, but we don't have a lot of time. So let's come back at 25 after. Is Chaz, does that give you enough time? You like a half hour? Yeah, I'll talk fast. You know me. I know you. All right, team. Well done. Go ahead and take a break. And we will see you at quarter after. Not a lot of break, but uh, anybody got any questions in the meanwhile? See if you want to open. Uh, yeah, you want to go ahead and stop uh, sharing, Rick? Thank you very oh, much. Well yeah, done, sure. sir. I hope you had fun because you did a great uh, job. I did. Thank you, Bob. Invite me back again. Take care. <laughs> All righty. See ya. See ya. Now, um, Chaz, do you have the PowerPoints with you or no? You there, Chaz? While, while everybody's on break, why don't we set this up? You want to unmute yourself, Chaz? Where do you go? So, Chaz, normally here I would uh, bring up the slides on my display. However, I can't do that because I'm also recording for Stafford. Stafford's teaching a class right now, so he can't uh, he can't do anything. Did are you there, Chaz? Did I lose you? You guys don't have the ability to uh, record to a cloud. You know, I recorded to my computer. That's probably a huge mistake, huh? Yeah, if you record to the cloud, you can um, you can share a screen and it doesn't take up any space on your computer. And it'll automatically send you an email when you're done with uh, the link to the recording if you want to send it out. You think you could do that for me, Sean? I can't record. You can only record to the cloud if you're using if it if you set it on your system. Um, if you can't do it, I could always I could always set it up on my Zoom account if you needed if you wanted to do it that way. But I couldn't I, I can't record on the cloud as a as a participant. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause on the recording and see if I.